press it and yeah, just press the red button. It's recording now. You press the red button. Okay. Luke twelve, sixteen to twenty says this. Jesus speaking. He told them a parable saying, The land of the rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, so and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? See, that's, that's reality. That's life. You're thinking it's going to go one way, and God says, uh uh uh, uh uh uh. Tonight, you're going to meet your maker. And all this stuff that you prepare for yourself is going to go to someone else. Right? He didn't redeem the time. He didn't even say, God, well, thank you for blessing me with an abundance of crops. Right? Sometimes, we mess our own selves up because we don't want to give God the praise, right? We don't want to thank him from whom all blessings flow. And then when his hand says, you know what, you don't, you don't need those blessings. Then we get mad and say, well, how could you treat me like this? God, how could you do me like this? I go to church every week. I give tithes. But God says, hey, what's important to me? Do you honor me? With your heart? Do you praise me with your worship? Because if you're not doing those things, then going to church and being faithful really doesn't mean a lot. Right? Second says first Thessalonians, excuse me. Chapter five, verse three says this. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. You know, the thing I like about that passage, and I know all the women know, when you're pregnant, you don't have your baby on a schedule to say, okay, uh, I'm going to the ladies' tea on Thursday, so you have to be born on Saturday after I have Friday to recover from the good time I had. Right? The baby is the one who dictates when he's going to be born, right? Because your water breaks when you're least expecting it. You can't say, oh, I want to go to the movies and see, you know, the Black Widow first. Then I'll have the baby. Because the baby will say, while you're enjoying the movie, it's time. Your water breaks while you're in the theater, right? So, you know, Abimelech, as I mentioned last week, he had three years when he was a top dog. He had three years to actually redeem the time and try to get it together. But looking at his actions, he didn't do that. He just kept doing what he knew how to do, which is kill, kill, kill. Right? And that's a problem. Because it takes a certain level of maturity to understand that even though your life is together and you're just waiting for God to come, he's given other people the same opportunity he gave you, right? Some people, you know, they just figured it out real early and got it together and they've been living for him. Other people, hard-headed people like myself, you know, you need a little bit more time, right? Because I'm thinking I know what's best, and after I ran my head into the wall a few times, then I start to realize, you know, maybe my grandmother was right. Maybe all the time she was telling me I need to come to the Lord, maybe she knew what she was talking about, right? James 4, 13 and 14 says this, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. 
What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, then vanishes. If you don't incorporate God into your plans, you might find yourself in for a rude awakening. You might find yourself shocked, right? You might find yourself in a hospital bed soon to meet your maker. So you really do need to redeem the time to examine your own self and ask yourself, am I doing everything I can do to, to get right with God? Right? A a am I confessing that I blew it yesterday and asking God to forgive me so I can step out today with a clean conscience and a clean heart? Am I doing all I can do to show God that I'm thankful for the life that he gave me? Right? You have to redeem the time. All of us here have a set amount of time, but we don't know when that time is, but God knows, right? So we have to live each day as if it's our last day, right? You know, it's nice and cool in here and everything's fine, but Shelly and I can get in the car and we get to the gate and someone just runs the light and bam, then we're gone, right? We don't know. So if we want to be right with God, we actually have to live each day as if today's the day we're going to meet God. Today's the day. So I want to do all I can to be right with you. Amen? All right, let me give a definition here. Irrational. It means a lack, a lack lacking usual or normal mental clarity or coherence. Or in other words, you're not in your right mind when you act irrational, right? And just so you know, this is not something deep or something that only, you know, other people do. When you start an argument over something that's really dumb, I mean really dumb, not even worth it, you're acting irrational because... A rational-minded person will say, you know, this is not even worth arguing about. Okay, whatever. Just go ahead and have it, right? When you don't have mental coherence, you're not thinking clearly. And you're just letting every little thing cause you to get bent out of shape, right? You know, like arguing over whether the toilet paper is right or this way or the other way. Is that really worth an argument or arguing over whether the toothpaste should be rolled or squeezed or whatever? People do this. It's just not worth, that's irrational, right? The Bible says that God has given us love, power, and a sound mind. So... If we're going to be right with God, we have to use the sound mind that he gave us because some things are just really not worth it. And I mean that. I, I really do. You know, um, if I have a dollar and you need 50 cents, I should just give you the whole dollar, right? We all agree I should just give you the dollar and be done with it. But if I'm going around following you, waiting for you to break the dollar and so I can demand my 50 cents, there's something wrong with me. Oh, you spent 25 cents. You got 75 cents. Now give me my 25 cents back. That's irrational. And we all do it. So let's get to the meat of what we're talking about today. Irrational violence leads to your own destruction, right? Because God, as a lot of people say, God don't like ugly. And irrational violence is just senseless, and there's no need for it. In Deuteronomy 29, 18 to 21, the Bible says this. 
Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit, one who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be saved, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man, and the curses written in this book will settle upon him, and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord will sing him out from all the tribes of Israel for calamity in accordance with all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. He says, I already know I'm going to do wrong. I'm going to be okay because no one knows. right? But God says, Whoo, bro, I'm about to smoke against you. I'm going to come against you so hard, you're going to wish you were never even born, right? And this is what is going to happen with Abimelech because he did not take the time to redeem where he was in life. And just so you know that Abimelech was not the only one who engaged in such activities. Second Chronicles 21 and 7 says this, Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariah, Michael, Shepatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them gifts, great gifts of silver, gold, and valuable possessions together with the fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Okay. When Jehoram had ascended to the throne of his father and was established, he killed all his brothers with the sword and also some of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. He walked in the way of the king of Israel as the house of Ahab had done for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy the house of David because of the covenant he had made with David. And since he had promised to give him a lamp to him and his sons forever. So just like Abimelech, he killed all his own brothers, right? But unlike Abimelech, he was already the king. So there's no need to kill your brothers because you're already the top dog, right? So killing your brothers... It's an irrational act because there's no need for it. You're already the king, and they've already been sent to live in other parts of the kingdom that their father gave them. But here's the ticket. Continuing in that same chapter, starting at verse 12, And a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat, your father, or in the ways of Asa, king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel, and have enticed Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem into whoredom, as the house of Ahab led Israel into whoredom. And also, you have killed your brothers of your father's house, who were better than you. Behold, the Lord will bring a great plague upon your people, your children, your wives, and all your possessions. And you yourself would have a severe sickness, with the disease of your bowels until your bowels come out because of this disease day by day. Day by day. So you kill all your brothers and you're thinking, well, because I'm a descendant of David and God promised not to remove David, I always giving him lamp. Here, God threads the needle. And God says, you're going to be punished. All your people are going to be punished. Your wives and children are going to be punished. And you're going to end up dying from this disease that I'm going to put on you. And God is still going to leave himself a lamp. Right? See, that's the thing. God can thread a needle that we can't even imagine. God's going to take care of him. He's going to punish his wives, punish his children, and he's going to have an excruciating death. Right? So... I just want us to make sure that we're doing everything we can to be right with God, right? You don't want to be like Abimelech. And I don't think anyone here is going to go out and kill people. 
But, you know, you can kill people with your words. You can have an attitude that really crushes someone, right? And the best way to fix that is not to do it, but the second best way to fix it is to, when God convicts you and you know you've done wrong, is to go to that person and say, you know, can you forgive me? I was a little bit harsh there, and I shouldn't have been. I'm really sorry, right? That's, that's what it takes. That's what it takes, because if you're not willing to do that, you may find when your fate can not be undone, when you have locked yourself in a position that sets you against God, right? The last straw for God was, okay, dude, you kill these people who were just going out in the field to do their regular work. They weren't even part of the rebellion that you crossed down. They were just people going out to the field to do their work, and you killed them. Then you went into the city and killed the people in the city. Then you destroyed the whole and None of that was even necessary, right? When your faith cannot be undone, that means, okay, your time, you, you messed up. You, you didn't redeem. You had the opportunity to fix it, and you chose not to fix it. The Bible says this in Exodus 11, 4 through 8. So Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill. All the firstborn of the cattle, there should be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow to me, saying, Get out, you and the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Moses was mad because Pharaoh had nine chances to say, You know what? Just go. Go and worship the Lord. Go and do what you need to do. Right? And if you read in Exodus, along the lines there, you know, Pharaoh tried to put conditions. Okay, well, you can go, but you got to leave the women and children. You can go, but you can't take a cattle. You can go, blah, blah, blah. But he never fully said, you know what? You can go. Then Moses said, hey, okay, it's game over now. Because now you're going to find out who is God and who is not God. And there's going to be a cry in this land such as never been before, because every single firstborn in Egypt will be struck down, right? And there's no way around it now. You can't go back and say, okay, Moses, I'm sorry. Can you not do that? It's too late. You had the opportunity, but you didn't follow through. 1 Samuel 28, 15 and 19 says this. Then Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dream. Therefore I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, and you did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hands of the Philistines. Saul had 40 years to get it together. 40 years. But he spent most of that time trying to hunt down David. Thinking, well, if I get rid of David, then I can keep the kingdom. That's not how it works. If God says, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and give it to someone better than you, then that's it. There's nothing you can do, no matter how hard you try. And what I find interesting here is Samuel's response. 
Why are you bothering me? Because if God is not talking to you, there's nothing I can do for you. There's no advice I can give you because I'm already not even amongst the land of the living. God is fulfilling his word that he told you when you didn't take out Amalek. Sometimes that seems really hard. But then again, 40 years is a long time. You can say, Lord, I messed up. I understand now what you meant. Please help me to live the remainder of my time in a right standing with you. You're still going to lose the kingdom, but maybe God will have a, a blessing for you anyway. Right? Because, truth be told, life itself is a blessing. Life itself is a blessing. Sometimes we take life for granted, thinking we're going to live forever. Oh, man, uh, I'm going to be 75 years old, and I'm still going to be okay. Really? God might say today, bro, that's it. That's it. Right? Every day that we wake up above ground is a day that we should thank God. Right? And, again, 40 years is a long time. You can do a lot in 40 years. You can strengthen the kingdom, make the kingdom better, encourage people to seek God. You can do all kind of stuff. Right? So that the 40 years that he blessed you with are not in vain. But if you spend every waking moment trying to hunt down someone who the kingdom has already been promised to, you're wasting that time. And finally, in Jeremiah 22, verses 24 to 27, the Bible says this. As I live, declares the Lord, though Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, were the signet ring of my right hand, yet I would tear you off and give you into the hand of those who seek your life, into the hand of those who you are afraid, even to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to the hand of the Chaldeans. I will hurl you and your mother who bore you into another country, where you were not born, and there you shall die. But the land to which they will long to return, there they shall not return. God is saying, even if you are my right-hand man, because you and your mom dabbled in witchcraft and led people astray, I'm going to remove you, and you're never going to come back. You want to come back, but you're never going to come back. Even though you were in the palm of my hand, right? Right? Because you have sealed your own fate when you turn to other gods, when you worship other gods, when you dabble in witchcraft. Right? These are things people do without really realizing the consequences of these actions. Right? You know, if you have a wife or a spouse, and then you cheat on your spouse, you can't say, please, baby, please, baby, please, just take me back. Uh, 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 just take me back. You know, for some people that may work. For most people, it's like, no, that's not going to work. You went beyond what you should have done. You acted irrationally when you made that decision. So now you have sealed the fate of this marriage, which is coming to an end because you didn't think with clear coherence and say, you know what? What I have is more important than a temptation you're offering me. Right? I remember Paul Newman when he was asked about, well, how is it that you and Miss Woodward have been happy all these years? He said, why should I go out for hamburger when I got steak at home? Think about that. I have everything I need at home, so why should I jeopardize that for something less? Right? We have to think, as Aretha Franklin said, we got to think, think what you're going to do to me. Because if we don't, the consequences may be something we don't want to bear. Let me finish it by saying this. Don't miss your chance. The time that you have right now is your opportunity to get it together with God. Don't miss your chance. Don't do it. 
This is God telling you, I'm giving you the opportunity. Whether it's five days, five years, or 50 years, don't miss your chance. Because when it's over, it's over. Right? Pharaoh missed his chance. Right? Jehoram missed his chance. He killed all his brothers, thought he got away with it, and then God didn't even send him a prophet. He sent him a letter to let him know, dude, you messed up. <sighs> Don't let that be you. 1 Samuel 6 and 6 says this, Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? After he dealt severely with them, did they not send the people away and they departed? It's a rhetorical question. They messed up. Then God came with judgment, and then after judgment was rendered, okay, we'll just let them go. Right? But the damage is already done. All the firstborn are dead. Right? Don't miss your chance. Don't just let this sermon go in one ear and out the other. You know, redeem the time. Make sure that you're doing all you can to be in a right relationship with God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for this time we give you all.